everyone. Uh, I want to welcome you to our Montgomery Village Public Safety Town Hall meeting this evening. Uh, I really want to thank you for joining us in this unique format. Of course, uh, with COVID on the rise, unfortunately, as we see in our community, uh, it is not safe for us to meet in person in a large grouping as we normally would. Uh, and so I wanted to make sure that we seize the opportunity uh, before we enter into the holiday season to make sure that we were talking about all of the things that were important to keep you safe in your community. Uh, this was all started because we have a brand new commander of the 6th District, uh, Commander Michael Ward, who you will hear from momentarily. Uh, and I'm very excited. I've known uh, Commander Ward for quite some time and think that uh, he's going to bring some great things to the village. Uh, but certainly wanted to make sure that everybody had an opportunity to meet him, to ask questions, uh, to lay out expectations, uh, to express concerns, uh, all of the things that are important when we talk about an organization that is there to protect and serve our community, our Montgomery County Police Department. Um, but we would be remiss if we talked about public safety and didn't also talk about all the other aspects of public safety as well. And so quickly we realized that we would be doing a disservice to our community if we did not also have an opportunity to hear from our fire chief about some of the things that are going on when it comes to this season and the risks that are posed. Uh, I know that uh, Chief Goldstein was just talking about a fire that happened last night. It was a massive fire. We wanna make sure that we keep our community safe. And then of course, with COVID-19, we've seen that it's wrecked uh, our economy and really made it difficult for a lot of people to continue to stay in their homes. And two of the people uh, who deal with addictions, but who also deal with some of the aspects around uh, scams that are out there to try and take advantage of you during COVID. Our sheriff and our state's attorney, uh, John McCarthy, are on the call as well. So again, you've got a uh, chock full of uh, great information and an opportunity to ask a lot of questions. I encourage you uh, to make sure you're utilizing our Q&A feature. Uh, when we get uh, to a point after the presentations, I'll make sure that we try and answer some of those. I also have my staff working diligently on Facebook. So we're live on Facebook. So hello to all my Facebook Live folks that are watching. And we'll be answering questions uh, on Facebook Live as well. They'll be sending those over live stream to us uh, so that we can try and get as many questions in as possible. So let me just say this. As your council member of the second district, uh, it really is important for me uh, to make sure that my community is always in touch and empowered. Uh, and the greatest way to do that is to have meetings like this to where we can talk about issues that are important to us. I don't have an agenda. Uh, my agenda is solely to make sure that you hear from uh, the folks who are serving you in the community and that they hear from you. That's pretty much all this is. And I wanna make sure that you understand that this is an opportunity for you and encourage you to make sure that your voices is heard, are heard. Uh, I will just ask, this is a time to be respectful. Uh, this is a time to make sure that even though we may have strong views or opinions, that we do so respectfully. Um, everyone who is here uh, has dedicated themselves to whatever craft they are in, whether it's our police, our fire, our sheriff, our state's attorney, and they've given of themselves to be in these positions. And so I hope we treat them accordingly while at the same time are very open about some of the concerns and questions we may have. So. Those are the ground rules, folks, okay? So no cursing, no any of those kinds of things. We're not gonna ask any questions like that. We're not gonna put them on live, of course, uh, for any of those kinds of things to happen. But I know my folks in the second district don't, uh, don't, don't do those kinds of things anyway. And so uh, from that perspective, you know, I know that this is gonna be a great meeting. Let me just close by saying this, thank you. Thank you to each and every one of you for showing your humanity during this pandemic. Uh, this has been something that has touched all of us. Uh, many of us have unfortunately lost loved ones to COVID. Many of us uh, continue to be uh, heartbroken by the tragedies that we see across this country when it comes to the loss of life uh, via uh, racial unrest and uh, folks who uh, are not adhering to the proper policies and procedures uh, that were outlined when it comes to how they interact with the public. Um, but we're also uh, want to make sure that we understand that uh, our police are here, our public safety officials are here 
to continue to protect and serve. They are the ones who are running into buildings uh, and making sure that folks are safe. And so from that perspective, uh, we certainly wanna make sure that we do everything to help uh, support them in that effort to keep us safe and also that we ensure that they're doing the same things by adhering to everything that they need to, to you know, make sure that we're all right. I wanted to acknowledge uh, a few folks that are here before I turn to our uh, panelists. Uh, I know that we have Council President Sidney Katz. Uh, Mr. Katz, would you just like to say a brief uh, hello to everyone? I would, and thank you very, very much to my friend and colleague, Councilmember Craig Rice. Thank you for doing this. I'm Sydney Katz. I'm this year's president of the County Council. Uh, I think I have a whole month left before uh, we change change uh, the County Council presidency. Uh, I'm also the uh, District 3 uh, County Council member, which is the neighbor of District 2. I have many friends and family that live in, in Montgomery Village and in District 2, so it's always good to, to be with them as well. I, I want to thank all the panelists for being here. And I can tell you my role this evening is to listen to, to the panelists and to listen to the public to hear what you have to say as well. So thank you very much, Craig. Well, thank you very much, Council President. Uh, and I, I was remiss in uh, forgetting that uh, he's not only the Council President, but he's also chair of our Public Safety Committee. So uh, aptly, certainly something, uh, someone who should be here, uh, certainly as we talk about public safety in a neighboring district, uh, <laughs> District 3, uh, right across the street. Um, let me turn to uh, Council Member Gabe Albernos, our chair of our Health and Human Services Committee, just to end a member of the Public Safety Committee to say uh, hello as well. Uh, thank you so much, Council Member Rice. Uh, really um, excited to hear the presentations tonight and the feedback from the community. This is a critically important issue. Uh, I have the honor of serving at large on the council and also in addition to serving as chair of the HHS committee, serve on the public safety committee as well. So look forward to the discussion and the presentations and thank you for your leadership, Council Member Rice, on this and so many other issues. Thank you very much, Council Member Albanos, and thank you for continuing to lead the fight when it comes to health and human services, certainly something that is very, very important. And I know we're gonna to touch on some of those issues around that, so it's really helpful to have you here as well. Let me turn to my good friend. Uh, we also have the state represented uh, here this evening, Delegate Gabriel Acevedo. So Delegate Acevedo, would you like to just say a few uh, greetings? Yeah, thank you so much, Council Member uh, Rice, and thank you to your office for convening this really important discussion. Uh, as was mentioned, my name is Gabriel Acevedo. I have the privilege of representing District 39, which includes uh, all of Montgomery Village. Uh, I'm a resident of Montgomery Village. I have been for a very long time and I love this community. Um, I recognize that we do have some challenges around public safety, uh, but I believe that as a community, we can certainly come together and work with uh, law enforcement to ensure that our communities are safe. Uh, I also serve on the House Appropriations Committee and its Public Safety and Administration Subcommittee. So. Uh, this is certainly a relevant topic that I want to ensure that uh, I'm listening to uh, the community as well as stakeholders. Um, and thank you again for everyone uh, for joining this evening. <clears throat> I do want to say really quickly um, uh, that I was uh, appointed by the speaker to the House Work Group on Police Accountability, and we've been having a lot of robust discussions about what public safety looks like. And so I encourage folks to reach out to my office uh, if you have uh, any questions um, or if you uh, have any concerns as to how we as a community move forward and ensure that we're keeping each and every one safe. So thank you again, Council Member Rice. It is good to see uh, some council colleagues on here and looking forward to listening and working with the community. Well, thank you very much, Delegate Acevedo. I wanted to acknowledge a couple other people that are on the call with us this evening, including uh, from the state's attorney's office, former uh, Council Member Phil, Phil Andrews, uh, who used to represent District 3. So good evening, uh, Council Member Andrews. Thank you, our former Council Member Andrews. Thank you so much for being with us this evening. Also, Eric Friedman, uh, Director of Office of Consumer Protection. Remember, I told you about those scams uh, that are going on out there. Our Office of Consumer Protection does an amazing job uh, of making sure that we're aware of those. If you uh, need more information about those, make sure you go on the website. All you have to do is type in Montgomery County uh, Office of Consumer uh, Protection, OCP, and you'll find 
a wealth of great information that's there. It's also, uh, there are links on my website as well. Uh, I know that we have CASA that's here, Mike Conroy from the Montgomery Village Foundation. Uh, you know, so I, I really just wanna say thank you for everybody for being here this evening. Let's get started. Let's jump right into the presentation. Uh, I don't have anything more to say beyond. Uh, I look forward to the questions and to the engagement afterwards. I wanna turn it over to your new district commander of the sixth district, Commander Michael Ward. Council member Rice, thank you very much. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, we've known each other for a number of years and, and we've worked together um, considerably. I'd like to start by thanking you and your staff for organizing and hosting tonight's event. Uh, on behalf of uh, my partners uh, as other panel members here, every opportunity we have to engage the public we serve is an important opportunity that we do not like to miss. Uh, so thank you so much for um, organizing and hosting tonight's event. Uh, my name is Michael Ward. Um, I'm a almost 27 year veteran of the Montgomery County Police Department. I started the Montgomery County Police Academy in uh, January of 1994. Uh, some of my previous ex assignments include uh, the director of our Special Investigations Division, director of our Criminal Investigations Division. I worked for several years in the Chief's Office uh, at headquarters. I was a deputy commander of our 5th District in Germantown. As a sergeant, uh, I led a, uh, a team of investigators uh, who investigated physical and sexual child abuse. I was a patrol sergeant in our fourth district in Wheaton, uh, predominantly working uh, midnight shifts. Prior to that, I was a uh, major crimes detective, a district detective. I worked for five years in a plainclothes uh, unit, and I started my career off as patrol officer in our second district in Bethesda. So I, I come with a um, fairly heavy investigative background, but, but I also have a background of working closely with communities uh, that we serve. Uh, this summer, uh, Chief of Police, Marcus Jones, uh, summons me to his office and asks me to uh, assume command of the 6th District, middle of the county. And for me, that was a, uh, a big honor. The responsibility that comes with that is it's enormous to say the least. So the 6th District, and I'm going to describe the district shortly, but the 6th District, um, the first screen that we have up here is our contact information, our location, and different ways to get in touch with us. I'll touch on that in just a second. Leadership in the 6th District has um, has changed uh, over the last couple of years quite a bit. Uh, two previous uh, district commanders here are now two of our assistant chiefs, uh, Assistant Chief uh, Willie Parker Lone and Assistant Chief Tanesh Patel. Teal. Um, the last uh, district commander uh, who was here for a short period, uh, Paul LaCorey, uh, retired recently and became a chief of police in uh, in another state. Uh, and I know these gentlemen well. I've worked with them for decades. Uh, we've had a number of turnovers in our lieutenant or deputy uh, district commander positions as well. Um, Lieutenant Nancy Hudson was here for a long time, and she recently retired after more than three decades of service. Um, we had a new lieutenant that was promoted last January. Brian Merriman came in, and this past summer, uh, he ran this district by himself as Commander LaCorey and Lieutenant Hudson were ending their careers here, um, and he did a phenomenal job. Uh, in fact, uh, he did such a good job that um, our, our chief, Marcus Jones, uh, recently asked him to be his administrative lieutenant. So we're going to be losing uh, Lieutenant Brian Merriman loss for the 6th district, but it's a gain for the chief and it'll be a gain for the department and I'm quite sure a gain for the county. Uh, we uh, have a longstanding lieutenant here, uh, Lieutenant Jay Wang, who also serves our country as a member of the Army Reserves. Lieutenant Wang has been on active duty for several months and will be due back with us this winter. He is uh, currently deployed in another part of the country. Uh, he's an extremely experienced um, lieutenant. He's also an attorney which is uh, also what he does in the military. Um, we have a new lieutenant that was just promoted, um, an academy classmate of mine, uh, Chris Fumagalli, was recently promoted from uh, sergeant to lieutenant and assigned to the 6th District. Uh, very, very excited to have him working with us. And we have a uh, yet a new, another uh, new addition to the 6th District, replacing Lieutenant Merriman, is uh, newly promoted uh, Lieutenant Dan Helton, uh, Dan is uh, coming to us from our community engagement division uh, as a sergeant, 
and I'm very excited to have him on board. He has contacts throughout the entire county. Uh, he has longstanding relationships with um, lots of different areas of our community, and we're going to be using his expertise uh, to the best of our abilities to improve the relationships here in the 6th District uh, between uh, the police and the community that we serve. So going back to the screen here, uh, our current address is up there. Contact numbers for uh, how to get a hold of us are up there. If you look under my name, you're going to see an email there. It says 6D Commander at MontgomeryCountyMD.gov. We have these special emails set up for each of the commanders in all of our districts uh, so that the community can reach out to us directly. We monitor this. I, I will say if there's anybody on this call that had emailed uh, over the summer and, and didn't get a response, I have to apologize with the, the change of command over here. When I got here, the emails were backed up a little bit. I'm working my way backwards through them. I do plan on responding to every single one of them. Uh, I have been monitoring them as they come in. Um, under that, you'll have the names of the uh, three lieutenants that I mentioned, and uh, the slide was actually submitted before the announcement of uh, Lieutenant Dan Helton's promotion and assignment here. And if we can go to the next slide. So if you look at the map of Montgomery County on the left there, you'll see it's divided into the six police districts that, that serve our county. The 6th District is bright square in the middle. It uh, includes areas like Montgomery Village, uh, Gaithersburg City, the Air Park, Rio, Kentlands. It's about 40 square miles. We have a population of over 150,000. It's an urban area. It's a very diverse area. Uh, it's a great area, to be honest with you. This is the first time I've been assigned to this district, and uh, working out of the 6th District is exciting for me because of the, uh, the, the different aspects that, in, that are uh, included in the district. Within the 6th District is the entire city of Gaithersburg, and uh, they are also served by the Gaithersburg City Police Department, led by Chief Mark Schroka. We have a fantastic relationship with uh, Gaithersburg City Police um, at the police officer level, but also at the executive level. Uh, they're, they're an excellent organization. They serve the city well. The way it works in, in this area is that uh, when their officers are in service, they are dispatched to calls in the city and when their officers are out of service, their calls will roll over to the county. Our officers work incredibly well together um, and, and typically we run our calls together jointly. Uh, also within the district, we have three high schools, Magruder, Gaithersburg and Watkins Mill. Uh, this is a small number of high schools for a district. Uh, a lot of the other districts, police districts have, have uh, more high schools. There's 26 total in the county. Um, they're served by our school resource officers. Uh, we have a long-standing agreement with the Sheriff's Department, and they staff the Bruder High School with, a, with an SRO. Gaithersburg City handles uh, the high school in, in the city, Gaithersburg High School, and the county police has an SRO, Stephen O'Malley, who's assigned to Watkins Mill High School. Next slide. So I wanted to include some crime stats. Um, these are last week's numbers, and they've changed slightly. Uh, between last week and this week, but not substantially. And if you look at these, um, these are year to date as compared to year to date last year. And if we use that metric to compare, uh, currently we are down a little bit in robbery, about even but slightly down in burglary, and about even but slightly down in larceny. We are up in aggravated assaults and auto theft. Uh, and, and fairly significantly, as of last week, we were up year to date as compared to last year at this time by 17%, and auto theft is up about 21%. So when we look at crime across the district, uh, that's about where we're standing currently. Um, some of the aggravated assaults that are on there are domestic related. Uh, we have others that are uh, that occur on the street. And uh, auto theft and theft from auto have always in Montgomery County been uh, patterns of crime that, that seem to be persistent. I'm going to talk a little bit more about theft from autos in just a moment. Can we go to the next slide? Well, now is that moment. So uh, three of the topics we came up tonight, uh, came up with tonight to, to discuss uh, in a community forum uh, are traffic complaints, theft from auto, and gang activity. And I'm going to start with uh, traffic complaints. So Montgomery County is a metro area. 
500 square miles, well over a million people, quite a few cars on the roadway. Um, in Montgomery County, we respond to 20,000. There are about 20,000 traffic collisions every year, in Montgomery County. Um, about half of those are writable, which means we write an accident report for those uh, collisions. Um, primary, primarily traffic enforcement in Montgomery County is the responsibility of the county police. Um, Maryland State Police do patrol uh, 270 and, and uh, the Beltway 495. We also have uh, Maryland uh, Transportation Authority Police that cover the ICC in 200. So I want to talk a little bit about um, why we enforce traffic. So it, it boils down to just one thing, and it's our deep desire to protect life and property. I have heard over the course of my career accusations that we write tickets because we somehow benefit from that, and it's not true. In uh, Maryland, police officers who issue tickets uh, to the public, um, that, that, and those tickets carry a fine, that money goes to the state of Maryland. Um, I've heard all kinds of crazy things, but I like that process because it leaves our motivation for issuing citations clean. Our only motivation when we issue, make a traffic stop and issue a citation is our deep desire to protect life, correct behavior by, and, and subsequently uh, protect life and property uh, from danger. So uh, during COVID, this has been a rough year uh, for everybody. It's been an exceptionally rough year for my profession. Um, our motor officers, each of our district stations has a has what we refer to as a motor squad. And these are uh, officers that uh, enforce traffic. And uh, the department made a decision to place the motor officers in the districts on administrative leave during COVID as a strategic maneuver to protect our workforce in the event that officers on frontline duty, uh, if they were to become infected with COVID and go out of service, we would have a reserve of officers uh, to take their place. Um, as a result, our motor officers were out of service until September 1st, uh, the same day, same time I, I was assigned to work here. Uh, as a result, some of the traffic complaints began backing up while they were off and uh, they came back to work and found that uh, they had quite a few traffic complaints. I can tell you in the sixth district, the traffic complaints that came in while the officers were off, while the, the motor officers were off, uh, all of those complainants have been contacted uh, by the motor officers and they're starting to work their way through those traffic complaints. One of the ways we address traffic safety is, is through the three E's, and, and some people are familiar with this concept, it's, uh, engineering, education, and enforcement. Engineering has to do with uh, us working in partnership with uh, county and state roads to look at the engineering of a road to see if the speed limit is appropriate or the road is designed and constructed safely. Education uh, in, involves our engagement with the community to educate them on traffic issues and, and what the law says and why it's important to, to obey it. And then enforcement obviously uh, involves the correction of behavior so that uh, we have people that comply with those laws and everybody else safe. So far this year, there's been 32 fatal accidents or collisions uh, within Montgomery County. Uh, 34 uh, uh, people lost their lives. Uh, in uh, in the sixth district, there has been uh, six um, of those uh, of those collisions. 13 countywide fatal collisions involve pedestrians, and it's not just uh, vehicles moving that that we are concerned about, but it's also pedestrians, uh, pedestrian safety that we're very concerned about. Um, if you look at any police officer in any, anywhere, unless they're brand new, they've been to a fatal collision and um, don't want to do that again. So that's 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 our desire. That's what motivates us to enforce uh, traffic law. It all comes down to safety, and that's that's the only motivation that we have. So I will also point out that traffic enforcement is dangerous uh, for us law enforcement profession. About one third of officers uh, nationwide killed in the line of duty. Uh, were involved in traffic enforcement or just driving in general. Uh, so for us, it's a risky endeavor, but we believe deeply in protecting our communities. And so we uh, we remain engaged in that. A couple other aspects of traffic safety involving complaints that we've been receiving. Um, we've, had a, we've had an issue with what we're referring to as car meetups. And I refer to these, because I'm older, as 
the Fast and the Furious cars. These tend to be cars that are altered and upgraded. Um, and uh, the owners of these cars like to meet up in different places. Up to that point, we're good. Fortunately, a lot of these meetups are also involving uh, disorderly conduct, negligent driving, reckless driving. Uh, and we've been addressing these in, in Montgomery County. This is also a national trend. I just saw a news story earlier today uh, speaking of these same type of activities in Portland, Indiana. So um, what happens is these car aficionados um, organize themselves, usually on social media, and they make a planned location to meet up. And it starts off fairly fine, like a car show. And then on occasion, there's a small percentage of the participants who then engage in dangerous and reckless activity. And that, that is when uh, law enforcement needs to um, take an enforcement role. So in the sixth district, uh, the location that uh, most often is used is the commuter park and ride on uh, 124 right next to 270. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is a complex situation because the park and ride is owned by the state. It's in the, uh, the city of Gaithersburg and then it's in the county of Montgomery. So what happened was uh, Gaithersburg City uh, was he heavily involved in taking the lead with Maryland State Police to, to um, put together a task force. And uh, it involved Maryland State Troopers, Gaithersburg City Police, Montgomery County Police, and Maryland Trans Transportation Authority Police. And uh, because the property was owned by the state, uh, they decided that they were gonna put up signboards banning anybody from being there unless they were there for um, normal activity, including parking or commuting. Um, and this seems to be working in the sixth district. And we've seen on social media, uh, different posts by participants in these events that indicate that, that what we are doing in the sixth district is, is having an effect on, on uh, stopping that here. Unfortunately, what we are seeing is that what we are doing is pushing these things. Uh, our third district up, up in the Northeast corner of the county in Burtonsville is another location uh, that, that is frequently used by these groups. And when we move them out of the sixth, sixth district, we're seeing that they end up um, over there. So the other complaints we're receiving in, in, in relation to traffic, uh, we're receiving the uh, normal complaints that we've been receiving for a long time for speeding, which we take seriously, and loud mufflers, which I think is related to car meetups and this current trend of um, altering these vehicles and, and uh, changing their performance. We also receive a number of parking complaints and uh, the traffic officers and uh, the patrol officers in between running calls when they have time have been uh, knocking those down one by one, contacting complainants, and then going out to um, confirm that the allegation is true and then taking enforcement. We just had a large enforcement effort up in the air park uh, in the commercial district up there, and I uh, believe that we successfully uh, dealt with that. I want to touch base briefly on theft from auto. Historically, one of the biggest trends of crime that, that impact Montgomery County. And it's one of two messages that I will share with you that we have been trying to put out for literally decades. Uh, that is to have the members of our public lock their cars and, and not leave valuables in their cars. The other message that we've been literally putting out for decades is uh, immigration law. Um, but this is a constant message uh, that, that we've been putting out to the public about locking vehicles, not leaving items in it uh, that could be stolen, not leaving the keys for one car in the other car, and then not locking it. And it seems to be a, a message that it's a struggle for us to express to the community where, where we can put an end to this, um, this activity. Uh, it's been going on for a very long time uh, for the criminals that, uh, that participate in this type of activity. It's almost like going to a buffet where they'll just go to a neighborhood and just go down the line of cars and look for the ones that are unlocked and see what's in there that they can take. Uh, it used to be just loose change, but these days we find people leaving garage door openers. And as I referenced a minute ago, keys for one car in the other car. And then we have not just a theft from auto, but we also have an actual stolen um, so if there, if there was one thing I could ask uh, the community in reference to this, which, which I believe is our largest pattern of crime, please, please, please lock your cars. Don't leave anything of value in it, especially don't leave the keys for one car in the other car. Don't leave the valet key in the car. Don't leave the key fobs in the car and don't leave your garage door opener in the car. A lot of times where these now turn into burglaries where the criminal will use the garage door opener to open the garage in the middle of the night and then go in and either enter the house through an unlocked door in the garage or steal from the garage itself. 
So I wanted to uh, then move on briefly to gang activity it does exist in Montgomery County. Um, we have several different types of gangs in Montgomery County. And I'll, I'll mention a couple of them briefly. We don't like to give them too much attention. Uh, we have transnational gangs in Montgomery County, like MS-13. I think most people are aware of that. We also have hybrid or local gangs uh, that operate in Montgomery County. You know, I'm actually, I'm not going to mention their names. They don't deserve the attention. But we have two that operate in the 6th District. Uh, there's another one that operates in the 5th District, and they're currently engaged in uh, altercations back and forth. We've had a number of shootings uh, recently, we believe, are attributed to these gangs. What I would like to do is, is talk briefly about how we address them. So in our Special Investigations Division, we have two gang units. Um, and they focus their, their activities on intervention, prevention, and suppression. And this almost runs parallel to what I was saying about traffic, where, where we use uh, engineering, um, education, and enforcement. Our gang, uh, the, the model that we use to address gang activity, as I said, involves intervention, prevention, and suppression. Uh, intervention, and, and, and a number of these activities, before I describe them, involve collaboration with, with other groups. Uh, so, for example, in intervention, um, our, our experts are partnering with uh, Health and Human Services, uh, Positive Youth Development, uh, HHS's uh, Street Outreach uh, Network, also known as SUNS, and um, they're working to uh, divert people from that specific lifestyle. Prevention, uh, same thing, we're working with our, our partners. Uh, we work with the Department of Recreation uh, to provide our opportunities for our, our young people to uh, engage in positive activities as opposed to negative activities. We work closely with the school system. And uh, part of this includes education. This, is, this includes education of stakeholders, other law enforcement officials, other people that we're partnering with, like uh, Montgomery County Schools, HHS. We will um, present to them on the gangs that are act, uh, uh, operating in Montgomery County and the types of activities that they are engaged in uh, so that they have a better understanding of what we're dealing with. Suppression, of course, is our enforcement effort. And uh, this is an area that we're also partnering with other people like the state's attorney's office, the U.S. attorney's office, uh, and other uh, entities that, uh, that we work with to conduct traditional uh, investigative enforcement efforts. Um, in a nutshell, that's, that's what we have been doing for a number of years uh, to address gang activity within Montgomery County. Uh, if we can go to the next slide real quick. I wanted to close up with uh, the importance of community engagement. Um, we, we, have, we have been operating under standard uh, marching orders for a long time uh, that that uh, come from the chief down. And, and uh, those marching orders are that every single police officer in Montgomery County is responsible for community engagement. We are well aware that every contact we have with the public creates an impression. And, and every one of those contacts is an opportunity for us to build a relationship of trust with the community that we serve, which is extremely important uh, for, for a number of reasons. So um, last I heard, we, we are in, involved in over 800 activities a year, engagement activities, just the Montgomery County Police Department. Um, I threw up on the screen uh, several pictures of some recent activities. On the left, uh, we had some uh, trick-or-treat activities uh, that occurred. In the middle is a, is a standard coffee with a cop that recently occurred uh, at the Starbucks on Muddy Branch Road. And in the bottom right, uh, I got cut off a little bit, but uh, that is our district community action team leading uh, an activity called Parking Lot Bingo. Um, I understand that everybody had a good time. And uh, in our district, uh, we engage, while it's the mission of every officer to, to take part in community engagement, um, we have specialists as well. Earlier, I referenced that Lieutenant Dan Helton was coming from our community engagement division. That's a division within the police department. The sole function is to facilitate engagement between uh, our department and the community. Uh, so Dan comes with a, with a wealth of experience there. Each district also has a community services officer or a CSO. Ours is Kim Jones, and she's fantastic. She's been working in this capacity for a number of years. Uh, lovely woman, excellent police officer, and, and I have to admit that I feel extremely lucky that we have her. 
We also have two specialized uh, patrol uh, shifts in the 6th District. One of them is the Montgomery Village team um, under the leadership of Sergeant Carlo Cavassier. And the other is the District Community Action Team, or CAT, supervision of Sergeant uh, Rob Sheehan. Both of these teams are, we call them specialized. They don't uh, respond, they don't get dispatched to calls. We use them to target quality of life issues, use them to heavily, we heavily use them to engage in, in community engagement. We also use them to target quality of life issues or problems that may pop up within the district. Uh, the Montgomery Village team does focus on Montgomery Village and the district community action team does spend time there, but they, they also are responsible for the rest of the district as well. And uh, they're interesting because they're half and half. They, they Both of these teams engage in, in, in the community, but they also are involved in enforcement activities. So uh, with that, I'd like to uh, allow the other panelists uh, their time to speak and, and thank everybody for uh, being here tonight. Well, thank you very much, Commander Ward. And I know that we're running a little bit tight, so I'm gonna turn right to Chief Goldstein. I did just wanna acknowledge um, that we do have uh, Judith Daka, uh, school board member uh, representing the area. So thank you very much, Judy, uh, for being on the call. Really appreciate you being here. And also wanted to remind folks that again, um, you can also uh, text questions to 240-686-5334. Again, that's 240-686-5334. So you can uh, send questions there. I'm looking at some of the Q&A questions that are coming in. They're great. I've seen some of the ones on Facebook as well. I promise you we will get to them. Let's just get through the presentations. And then, so I've seen them. Trust me, I've seen the questions. They're coming in well. Uh, and so let me turn to Chief Goldstein uh, to talk about fire and rescue. Good deal. Thank you, Mr. Rice, and thank you, uh, everybody, for joining us tonight. And we just rolled out of October. October is Fire Prevention Month. The clocks were changed. We rolled back as we went from daylight to, to, to standard time. We used to talk about change your clock, change your battery. No longer should you be changing the battery on your smoke alarm. Your smoke alarm must be equipped with a 10-year battery. That battery is good for the entire life of the smoke alarm. Think about that. Your fifth grader, you have somebody who's older than a fifth grader, that smoke alarm needs to be younger than they are. Anything that's in excess of 2010, that smoke alarm loses its efficiency over time and does not become your silent partner and helps you through the process of, of early detection. So smoke alarms. A lot of confusion about smoke alarms as it relates to where they should be. There's a lot of variability in the construction age of your house, townhouse or residence, and where those are, are, are required to be. So go to mcfrs.org and mcsafe, look at that reference. Critical answer, near the sleeping area, inside the sleeping area, and one on every level of the house. But there's a lot of specific, specific requirements. The other point of confusion that people in the last couple of years when the 10-year alarms came out were that they were taking out their hardwired AC powered alarm and replacing it solely with a battery alarm. No, absolutely not. That battery is the backup. Those AC or hardwired alarms are interconnected. So when one in the basement goes off, the one outside or inside the bedroom sounds, giving you early warning, wider warning throughout the house. So make sure your smoke alarms are less than 10 years old when you change your clock, give it a little TLC. Vacuum it, cobwebs, dust, all kinds of life accumulations, and press that test button at least once a month for the smoke alarm. I'm gonna roll forward to the next one. Now we talk about smoke alarms, carbon monoxide. Mr. Rice is going to uh, make sure I hit all these points the best as as he was the, the champion of this law that went into effect in July of 2019. Carbon monoxide is known as the silent killer because you can't smell it. You have no sensory ability to detect it, not like smoke. 
Where does carbon monoxide come from? The best answer is from a blue or orange flame. Maybe it's your gas fireplace. Maybe it's your oven or a hot water heater or dryer or furnace. But anything that uses a blue or orange flame that may be with wood or natural gas or propane, but it's got a nice flame. Also understand that carbon monoxide is a byproduct of the internal combustion engine. Tragically, it is not surprising we find cars left running in garage spaces. That accumulation of carbon monoxide migrates into the house. So starting July 1st, 2019, all residential structures that were built prior to 2008 have to have a carbon monoxide alarm. If you have the production, or excuse me, if you're using a fossil fuel, gas, wood, propane, or you have a garage attached parking space, absolutely best. The other factor of where to put the carbon monoxide alarm, you need to have one on every level. And again, most critical outside of your sleeping area. That is where you're, you're most vulnerable. You're asleep at night. That's why it's referred to as the silent killer because you go to sleep at night, you become overwhelmed by the effects of the carbon monoxide and then in turn get found days later by others because you were succumbed to the carbon monoxide poisoning at night. Carbon monoxide, make sure you have, if you have an all electric apartment or townhouse, good idea to have one, but not required. Rolling on to what is our major cause of house fires? Kirsten, next slide, if you would. Thank you, thank you. So we're in the winter time. I understand it was just 75 degrees yesterday and it wasn't likely we were talking about space heaters but it will be in the 30 degrees here in the next couple of days and we'll be talking about space heaters and space heaters that need space. Space heaters are alternative heating sources and how they are a number two, the number two cause for home house fires. And as this slide talks about, they are almost accounting for 85% of the home heating fire deaths. Space heaters need space. You need to make sure that that is a, at least three feet away from anything combustible. The couch, the chairs, the, the drapes, the bedding. Big issue there, the bedding. Keep that space heater away from the bedding so that you do not have the comforter or the blanket or something rub up against it and become ignited by the heat and the radiant heat off that space heater. So space heaters, very important. The next two slides, which will be available through the packet through the council member's website, talk about other key factors, other key things to think at home. The number, one, the one there in the middle, don't overload your home. We have been concerned and seen an uptick in electrical extension cord fires. We're now at home, as we all are right now. We're using our laptops, we're using the table, we're making up these improvised office places, plugging in a lot of peripherals, extension cords into power strips. We're running out underneath the carpet. All of those are no-nos. Use the right power strip or extension cord for the right purpose. Make sure it's the right size. Always aim for it to have a underwriter's laboratory or being rated by UL or safe for use. But don't overload your electrical circuits. Don't run that extension cord underneath the, the, the rug. As we talked about space heaters, cool your ashes. We will have a fire this winter that's from fireplace ashes. If you have a fire in your fireplace, you clean out those ashes. After they feel cool, you make sure they're into a metal container and placed far outside of your house. No plastic bags, no paper bags. Don't put them inside the garage or next to the carport. Whatever container, ideally metal, that you put it in, take it five to 10 feet away from anything in the yard that's combustible. 
because very, very often a little bit of agitation, that ash gets a little bit of air exposure and that bag or box or, or the, the, the cardboard trash can and cardboard container ignites, catches the, the house on fire, and sadly we have a, a resident who is dis, displaced from the fire. And then the last slide talks about our holiday candles as well. As we're getting into a, the, the time of year where we're going to see our holiday celebrations, a burning candle is a great item to reflect and, and bring uh, memories to our house. Think about electric candles. Think about the flameless candles. Anything that gives you that open flame needs to be attended. If it's for your holiday activities, if it's for a power outage situation, you can never leave the candle lit unattended and have um, a, a, a concern. Now, there's a lot of other information that we rolled through greatly. We are very much engaged in the Montgomery Village area with Fire Station 8. It is the busiest fire station for Montgomery County that runs a little over 10,000 emergency responses a year from its Russell Avenue and Lake Forest uh, Mall, Montgomery Village Avenue location. So if you have information, mcfrs.org and mcsafe. And I welcome your questions as we get through the rest of our great presenters. Thank you, Mr. Rice. Well, thank you very much, Chief Goldstein. Unfortunately, um, it's so much information, it's really hard to try and condense it in a short period. But I did want to remind folks, uh, they can go on to my website. If you just type in Montgomery County Council Member Craig Rice into Google, the website's there. We'll have the presentation up, so you'll be able to access that. We'll be pushing it out on social media as well, so you have access to all of the information that came in this presentation this evening. Let me quickly turn to Sheriff Darren Popkin. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Rice, for the introduction and, as always, for your leadership. Um, I want to say good, e good evening to everyone tuning into the town hall. My name is Darren Popkin, and I am the sheriff here in Montgomery County. As with all of the public safety agencies represented uh, on this call, the sheriff's office has been fully functioning throughout the pandemic. I want to, for tonight's purposes, with the limited period of time, I want to focus on two areas uh, that the Sheriff's Office that have a great community interest uh, for this evening. The, the first one is the Family Justice Center, which is uh, the slide that is currently up on, on your screen at the moment. So the Family Justice Center, for those of you who don't know, is the domestic violence center in Montgomery County. It is run by the Sheriff's Office with great partners from the police department, from the, the state's attorney's office, as well as a number of private nonprofits. Um, it's located in downtown Rockville, adjacent to the courts. And um, as I have said, it remained fully open throughout the public health crisis and continues to remain fully open. We noticed um, at the beginning of back in March, at the beginning of the pandemic when it first hit, that on any given year, uh, there's about 5,000, a little over 5,000 domestic-related domestic related 911 calls in any given year. And those calls were, were, were just not coming in to what they were. Uh, we knew that people were together and staying home because people were not going out. Uh, we were seeing a significant decrease in the number of clients in April and May. Um, so we felt as if something absolutely had to be done because we knew that the, what we were seeing of the calls that were coming in were uh, the, the cases were way more severe and the danger level had increased really significantly in just the first few months that COVID uh, kind of existed. So what we were able to do is uh, set up a uh, some resource information on the FJC website, Family Justice Center website. Um, th there is often a, for those of people who were at home and their spouses were at home, and unfortunately there was some family violence, it was very, very difficult for someone to get away and call 911 or to get away and actually uh, uh, come to the Family Justice Center and, you know, and, and a report
support some of this uh, potential problems. So we, we were able to, on an ad campaign, uh, create a safe at Montgomery County MD.gov website, uh, an email address for those uh, to, for emergency purposes. Uh, we ended up collaborating with the police department, state's attorney's office and county executive Elrich's office uh, to provide um, uh, information for what to do while you were in a COVID-19 lockdown but you were not safe. And that was our, uh, really our concern. Once this was actually done after the first three months when there was some information really that needed to be out there, what to do during a pandemic, because obviously this has never occurred before, the numbers started coming back up to what are the average number of people that would normally come to Montgomery County's Family Justice Center, the Domestic Violence Center. So, so the, the information that was put out um, the, the number of people who are now coming is, it's kind of a double-edged sword because we are seeing an increase in the number of people that are coming that need assistance and need help. Um, and we gotten out of, get, get them out of their unsafe environments. But then again, there is enough, there is such a need for this that, um, you know, the people are there and available for that sort of information. One of the, the real difficult parts of it were, um, Every year we send children to camp. Uh, these are uh, children who witness domestic violence and really need a break from some difficult living environments. And unfortunately, during uh, this particular year, we were not able to send them to camp, but we were able to put together a virtual camp uh, that lasted throughout the entire summer that got ch children out of that environment and um, and we're able to you know have some uh, hopefully a little bit better, better um, uh, resources and a little bit better, better home life with that. So my, my takeaway on the Family Justice Center in the brief period I, I have is that there is no need for someone who is facing a family violence. Please reach out to the Family Justice Center. Please call 911 if you're in danger and don't wait because if you're not safe at home, we wanna make sure that, that you are. The other thing, uh, Council Member Rice, that I would like to just touch on tonight is uh, the evictions. Um, the Sheriff's Office is responsible for the evictions in Montgomery County. Um, it is something that is statutory uh, duty that the Sheriff does have. But as you know, during this pandemic, um, I worked very closely with the courts and there was a moratorium on evictions. There are so many people out of work and it is very difficult for people right now um, to make their rent payments and we completely understand that. And that's why um, between the governor's moratorium, the court's moratorium and the CDC's moratorium on evictions, um, there are very few evictions that are actually taking place right now. Um, almost all of the evictions that are currently occurring uh, were pre-COVID evictions that all got canceled uh, due to COVID. So there was 175 evictions that got canceled at the time of, of um, when the, the governor put his moratorium in during the beginning of COVID. And so the, unfortunately the, the, the moratoriums have ended uh, other than the federal moratorium. Uh, but there are so many areas in Montgomery County, the County Council has been leading the way with money available for uh, people um, that are facing really uh, terrible situations. The courts are also uh, looking at anybody, any filings that come in um, asking for assistance as well as the CDC moratorium that would go directly from the tenant to the landlord. So, and, and Health and Human Services, um, as Council Member Rice would tell you, has been in the forefront of working with the Sheriff's Office on these matters. And we are absolutely trying to limit any sort of exposure anybody has at this particular time. Um, and the, the federal moratorium would end at the end of the year. So please don't, if, if you're in a position and you believe that, that this is, eviction is a possibility, please don't wait, reach out to the social service agencies that are working hard with this, reach out to the courts, Look at the CDC website right now. There's a big uh, part uh, explanation on it as well. Just don't wait for the last minute. 
um, as, as we move forward toward the end of this year. And uh, Councilman Rice, I'll leave it at that. And I'm certainly here for any questions as uh, we move forward. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Sheriff Popkins. The questions keep rolling in. So folks, I'm taking great notes and grouping all of these questions together. So we have uh, questions for all of our participants. Let me turn very quickly to uh, uh, Mr. McCarthy, who's our state's attorney, but first wanted to acknowledge, we've also got Dave Humpton from Montgomery Village Foundation. Good to see you, Dave. Thanks so much for being here. And then uh, one of our other colleagues on the Montgomery County Council, Council Member Will Jawando, has also joined us. So Council Member Jawando, thank you so much for being here as well. Uh, let me turn to uh, Mr. McCarthy and then uh, right after Mr. McCarthy goes, then we'll jump into answering some of these great questions that have been coming in. Uh, Craig, I want to thank you and Kristen for putting putting this thing together. It really was a flawless thing, and you kept us right on task throughout the entire program. Look, uh, you and I have been friends for a long time, and we've worked on a lot of issues. I want to thank you uh, for, for your strong voice in the area of public safety in general, and particularly in the area of truancy prevention in the community, which I know you care a lot about and the truancy prevention program for Montgomery County Schools is run through the state's attorney's office. And also your very strong support for the mental health courts, which we've established in both the district and circuit courts. And I think everybody recognizes how profound the intersection is between individuals who have mental health challenges uh, and, and, and are looking at how we're gonna reimagine how we're gonna police in our community. Uh, I'm honored to be here with Scott, Darren and Mike I'm also, let me tell you, every, every other person almost that's been introduced is a partner in many ways for us when we are talking about public safety in this community. Uh, uh, Eric Friedman, who, who, who is with Consumer Protection, Eric and I go out, along with Sid Katz, we are out all the time talking to seniors in the community how to prevent themselves from being victims of fraud. It's great to be with those two great allies on that issue. Sid also is a leading individual on, on the mental health issue. Judy Gaka was my partner when we started the truancy prevention program. I think the very second school that we started at or went to was a school where uh, Dr. Gaka used to be the principal down there in Silver Spring. And she was there when we started it and still comes to our graduations. Uh, Gabe Malbernas from the County Council. Uh, uh, Scott was talking, I, I, actually, I think Mike Ward was talking about community engagement. You know, the, the, the way I got involved with, with Gabe and what our office did was that idea of getting kids actively engaged in positive activities after school, I think mean, Gabe was a real leader on that with uh, when he was head of the uh, uh, the uh, uh, Department of Recreation. Having said that, what's the biggest thing that's impacted criminal justice? I'm going to go through a couple things very quickly. COVID, 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 COVID. How has it impacted us? Well, initially, it, 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 it impacted us for a couple of months in a good way. Uh, calls for service were down for about 50% and arrests were down 50%. Uh, when when, when uh, Captain Ward tells me that some of the numbers for the year over year are up in the village, I find that alarming because they really fell for about two or three months drastically. So the fact that in any category we would exceed last year's numbers is somewhat surprising and a little bit more alarming than, than you would think. Uh, I, I would say that... Uh, my friend, the, the great sheriff from Montgomery County, Darren, Pop, Darren Poppin, was talking to you about the Family Justice Center. After the press conference that we all participated in, uh, there was an uptick in calls for service for domestic violence of 100% overnight. 100%. Were there people in this community that were isolated, that didn't know we were still open for business? We, made, we were sending out messages on pizza boxes with merchants. There were a lot of good people who came together with, with, with the elected officials in this community to get the word out, we're open for business, we're here to protect you. I remain concerned about a population that I think we are not learning about. How do we learn about abuse against children in our community? Typically from teachers and counselors. I will tell you our numbers of complaints to, for child abuse are down. I don't think child abuse is down. I think it's hidden from us. I think that maybe the, the charge to anybody listening to this is we really have to be vigilant looking in our community to the children in our community who are much more isolated than they typically are. And the typical reporters, we don't have access to them right now. And children don't see their teachers who normally who are, are who we see. 
what was another challenge for us here in Montgomery County? And it counts for everybody. Thinning the population in the jail. Look, I, I will tell you, uh, the, the population in Montgomery County Jail during the time that I've been state attorney through a, a lot of different, is down about, is down 35%. It's down 35%. But I will tell you, we are at the lowest levels that I can even think of. We're down around 550 people in our three jail facilities, which is about three or 400 below the typical numbers uh, that, that occurred about a decade ago in this, in our community. We were very interested in making sure that we're protected, not only the men and women that worked in the institution, but the people who were incarcerated, war crimes they committed, but we had to make sure they were safe. And there were a lot of progressive things that were done to get the people out of jail that did not need to be there. Uh, I also will tell you, we're back. The courts are operating. We never closed down. We were consistently and always doing bond reviews. We were reviewing the statuses of individuals who were in jail on a daily basis. Some days when COVID first hit, I was receiving 50 bond reviews a day from attorneys in the community asking us to release their prisoners. And we had to look at that. And we tried to intelligently decide balancing public safety and consideration for individuals who might be exposed in a jail setting to COVID when they should be released. They've done an extraordinary job in our jail. The numbers get published every week to me and very typically for the last three months, we've essentially not had any COVID in the jail. And that just, that uh, 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 there's a woman named Angela Talley that runs the jail. She deserves a lot of credit. We are grand jury. We are up to speed with our grand jury. We have no backlog. Our district courts, that means we've been doing trials in the district court on minor misdemeanor matters for about two months. Uh, as Darren knows, because he's in charge of, of the security in the courthouse, we are now back doing jury trials. We, we have had more jury trials in Montgomery County in the last two weeks than any jurisdiction in the state. Uh, and we are doing that because of the coordination of Judge Greenberg, the cooperation of the sheriff, but we are doing the people's business and giving people the, you know, giving people the opportunity to be tried for cases where they were sitting waiting for that. Uh, I want to follow the lead of, of, of uh, Captain Ward, and I'm not going to uh, praise the, the gangs that are in your, your community, but I will tell you, I think the character of gang-related activity is not consistent throughout your, 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 your entire police district. I think, uh, I think Mike talked about hybrid gangs. I think the hybrid gangs, which are local kids without international ties, are mainly in the village. Do I think... In Gaithersburg City and maybe closer down by the mall, there may be a more international flavor with international gangs that are active in our county. The answer is yes. We do have gang-related activity. The character of the gang-related activity is different from time to time. I'm, I, I just I want to say, and I know that, that uh, Craig wants to get to the questions that you have. Uh, we continue, besides the courts running, we never, ever stopped running our drug diversionary program. Our drug court ran all the, always through COVID. We never stopped running our mental health court. It ran all the way through COVID. Uh, there's national statistics that were generated by the Obama study that was done in 2015 that say 50% of police contacts in the United States, the person on the other side of the contact as a mental health issue in play. We have to deal more intelligently with the issue of mental health if we are gonna make any progress in the area of, of police reform and, and, and criminal justice reform. Uh, I will tell you that uh, in terms of community engagement, we are continuing to present Choose Respect conference. We've got almost 500 uh, conferences on Choose Respect. We have uh, 60,000 kids have attended our lectures on, on uh, Speak Up, Save a Life, which has to do with moving kids away from opiates and drugs. And uh, I did a senior presentation. I, I live in your district, by the way. I, I am a resident of 6D. I've been here for six years. Uh, I was at Asbury last week and tomorrow, uh, I'm gonna be at Oasis uh, speaking to a group of about a hundred people there. Uh, I'm honored to be here. Uh, I know there's tons of great questions out there. Craig, thank you for having me. I'm honored to be here with a, a wonderful group of people. Thank you. 
Well, thank you very much, Mr. McCarthy, and thank you to all the panelists. Again, a reminder, please, uh, if you do have questions, I've already seen tons that have come in online. I've got a huge list that I've already grouped, so hopefully I'll be able to make it easy for our panelists. 240-686-5334. Again, 240-686-5334 is the number for you to text in your questions. You can also put them on Facebook Live. Uh, I have staff that's monitoring that as well as we're monitoring the Q&A right here on Zoom. So let me get to the first one. Uh, this is for you, uh, Commander Ward. Uh, this is regarding school resource officers. And the question is uh, that the, a, a person had attended uh, Councilmember uh forum and had talked about um, replacing school resource officers and the need for additional funds. Uh, what they were recommending, and this is something specifically that I'm not familiar with, but that they were saying that maybe if we could change uh, the policy of using LMR and converting to FirstNet, that that might be a cost savings for uh, the police department. Um, can you address that? I, again, I'm not sure what that is, I, I, but, but I'm sure that you do, Commander. Actually, unfortunately, I don't. I saw that question in pending. Um, I know FirstNet has to do with communications, possibly. There is a FirstNet that does that. Um, I would uh, like person who posed that question to reach out to me directly by calling me at the station or emailing me at the, uh, the, the email that was on the front page of the, of the uh, presentation. I'm not quite clear um, what the content of that question uh, involves. Okay. We do well, that's fine. We, can, we, we do can believe strongly. And come back to it. Sounds good. Thank you. Yep. Yep. And then just to be very clear, because there was a question about uh, school resource officers in general. So let me just address some of that very quickly. Um, we have one school resource officer in, assigned to each high school right now. Um, there is uh, proposed uh, legislation that may eliminate the school resource officer program. The council had actually come up with that discussion earlier in the year during budget. Uh, we decided to wait until the school board uh, had made a decision. I know that Dr. Daca is on the line, but I know they are currently in deliberations around that decision right now. And the council said that we would take guidance from Montgomery County Public Schools as to how we would move forward. Let me just address one point of that that deals with cost savings, Commander Ward, that you can address, which is um, there is kind of the assumption that if we got rid of school resource officers, that we could actually put that money towards mental health, towards counselors, uh, towards other kinds of things in our county budget. I know you aren't a member of the council and can't decide on where we appropriate funds, but talk a little bit about the officers. Those officers are actually sworn officers in Montgomery County Police Department. They wouldn't just go away. They'd still be on our payroll. Is that not correct? It is correct. And, and you're right. There are 26 public high schools. There are uh, tw one, one SRO in each school. We believe very deeply in this program for a number of reasons. And I want to point out a, a couple facts that sometimes get missed in the conversation. First of all, um, our school resource officers are highly trained professionals. When you look at any law enforcement officer, already you're looking at a highly trained professional uh, who needs certain personality traits to, to be able to successfully perform the job and accomplish the mission. Our SROs have that and more. These are extremely patient and caring people that enjoy working with the students in our school and they have very strong relationships with the, uh, the school system in the school. I'd also like to point out in Montgomery County, you know, we're the most diverse country in the world, the United States is. And when you look at a, a jurisdiction like Montgomery County, we are very diverse here. And our SROs, and the police department as a whole reflects the community that we serve. Uh, the SROs uh, by happenstance in Montgomery County actually are probably more diverse than the very diverse community that we serve. Uh, I don't know the exact numbers, but the majority of them are minorities. Half of them happen to be female and they, they represent a very diverse background, which is important for a lot of reasons. Um, and they're in these schools uh, working with these students. We have a very strong MOU with the school system and, and it delineates when we do and don't make arrests. We don't enforce uh, minor infractions at the schools, we don't enforce um, violations of school rules. And uh, unless there's a danger to the public that's imminent, we don't even make arrests without consulting with the schools themselves. 
So the bottom line is the arrests that are made in schools by the SROs are very few and far between, and they are very serious offenses where we basically have no choice but to make an arrest and introduce an offender into the criminal justice system for the safety of everybody, and hopefully to divert that offender back into a path of normality. But it's all done in close work with the school system by a group of highly trained professionals. Excellent. Thank you very much. My next question is for Chief Goldstein. Chief Goldstein, the question is, how do I change my hardwired smoke alarms? Which of those smoke and CO alarms are good ones? And is there a way to get free ones, including possible partnerships with the Red Cross? You combined a couple of questions there that I was working on typing responses to. So well done. Well done, sir. The best response there is go to 311, request MCFRS to come out and do a home safety check. So again, because of the complexity of the age of the structure and the requirements, it's very limiting for me to give anybody a fixed answer here. You go to any of your big box stores, CVS, or even your, your, your grocery stores, you can see smoke alarms. And, and they're available there in the $15 to, to $20 range. Some of them are even combined, carbon monoxide and smokes. So as for us to come out, we're doing those virtually as well during the pandemic. We can do that through uh, this same medium and let us come out. The questions of Hardwire. A hardwire alarm needs to be replaced with the same model and manufacturer of alarm. The connectors on the back are unique to a manufacturer, so brand A and brand B. So if you know what brand it is, you can purchase the new brand. Our core recommendation, have a licensed electrician manage that because he or she is going to be aware of that, go to the right provider to get brand A alarm, get up on the ladder, unclip the old ones, clip in the new ones, and be back into sync all together. So use an electrician for hardwire, go to 311 or our website and request a home safety check. We'll come out virtually or in person as need be and give you some recommendations on those alarms. The last point was the free ones. Absolutely. We have a great partnership with the, the utilities, Pepco, as our key provider in smoke alarms. So if there's an event in a community that you're set up in, in the village and you want us to come out and be able to provide community education and fire safety information, reach out to us. And we do provide free smoke alarms to those in need. We always do that every call, every house making sure that there's a smoke alarm presence, if it's for a medical call or for a water leak or for a fire. Thank you, Mr. Rice. Thank you very much, Chief Goldstein. And I can tell you, I've actually seen it. Uh, I was actually on a fire ride along with uh, Kingsview uh, Station in Germantown. And we actually went to a call where a woman could not reach her smoke detector that was going off. It was a very high ceiling. She was an elderly uh, lady and the fire department responded. Uh, went there, uh, checked to make sure that there was nothing wrong, obviously, that there wasn't a fire, but then replaced that uh, smoke alarm for uh, the woman. Again, service, that, that, that really is what it's about. And so I've seen it firsthand. Uh, you guys do an amazing job. So thank you very much for that. Let me turn to Facebook Live. We've got a question. Uh, it says, um, how can we expect our police uh, to be serious about all kinds of issues concerning our community when they are not following mass guidelines. And so, uh, Commander Ward, talk a little bit about what the guidelines are for our officers in the community and their requirement for wearing masks. So within county buildings and in places where the public is, is uh, required to wear a mask, uh, we do. Uh, frequently when we're outside, uh, you'll see the officers uh, possibly not wearing a mask. They are encouraged when they are interacting with the public, even if they're outside, to put the mask on at, at the very least as a courtesy to the public. Um, I'd like to know um, a little more about the question to, to properly answer it, uh, including you know, where are the officers being seen uh, when they're not wearing masks. They shouldn't be in any buildings without a mask and uh, they're being encouraged to wear their masks even when they're outside and, so, and properly socially distanced uh, when dealing with the public 
uh, when they can. So thank you very much for that answer. And that, and that to me, I hope for the folks that are watching at home, um, that's why we give you contact information. So if you see something that you feel is, isn't right, just as when it comes to, again, for us uh, seeing something and saying something about things that we think are criminal and want to report it, if you see something to where someone isn't doing what you think they're supposed to be doing, just please call. Um, that's why the commander has given his number and his information so you can reach out uh, and make sure that we all get better. Uh, sometimes, unfortunately, we need to be reminded, all of us, right? And so it's important for us to make sure that we're doing that to keep us on task. All right, so let me go uh, to another one for you, Commander Ward. Um, we've seen increased traffic throughout the village uh, that is incredibly concerning. What can we do about lowering speed limits or have more traffic enforcement? You kind of touched on this during your presentation. Uh, it's one of the things that I've heard all across the county that we're being challenged with to make sure that people remain safe. So uh, on the county website, uh, the county police, excuse me, website, there's a number of good resources there. And I think I'm gonna be able to answer a couple of questions at once here. Um, on our website, uh, under publications or reports, we do have our annual crime report, which talks about um, crime statistics in the different uh, parts of the county. If there's any questions about how the 6th District or Montgomery Village compares to other parts of the county, the answer can be found there. We also have reports on uh, our annual use of force report is there, uh, pursuit report, uh, and a couple other reports as well that um, may answer some of the questions pending. Uh, there's also uh, information on there on how to request uh, automated traffic enforcement in any uh, particular location in the county. Uh, that's also on our website. That would be one way to uh, request uh, that type of, um, of, of a solution to the issue. In terms of changing speed limits, the police, uh, we don't control that. It's, it's depending on if it's a county or a state road. And then uh, the engineers that work for these entities are the ones who establish the speed limits. I think requests can be made, made through the county to take a look at speeds and uh, possibly capture them. So thank you very much for that. And let me just remind folks that, again, if you see uh, things that are happening in the community where you see an increase in speeding, please reach out to our office um, to let us know. Uh, you also heard from uh, Delegate Acevedo, uh, who's on the call, because with state roads, that's certainly something that they can do as well. You need to just let us know when you're seeing these kinds of things. We're certainly taking notes this evening uh, and want to know more about where specifically you're seeing this. Uh, so reach out to us and let us know. You can always just report these things to 311 and let them know as well so that we can start building. OK, there are a lot of questions and concerns about this particular area. It gives us the ability to reach out to uh, Captain Didone, who's with our Traffic Enforcement Division of the Police Department, to go out and start looking at whether or not we need to do some more traffic enforcement or actually change the speed limit. So all of those things are within the process uh, that can be done. Uh, another one for you, Commander Ward. Uh, the community of Montgomery Village is incredibly diverse. Uh, however, we've often seen that uh, workforces, including the police department, do not always reflect that diversity. Um, what is the diversity of the 6th District uh, Police Department, if you do have that? And then what are you doing to increase that diversity to make sure that our police department reflects more of what our community looks like? This has been a, um, an issue in, in my profession for literally decades. And, and I think the, the person that posed the question hit the nail on the head. It's incredibly important important for police departments to represent the communities they serve for many, many reasons, including uh, perception of the community that, that the police that uh, serve them represent them uh, equally. And that leads into issues of, of trust by the community and so forth. So uh, our recruitment efforts, um, you know, usually the, the, the issue is addressed in the area of uh, recruitment, hiring and retention. Uh, there was actually a very good uh, federal paper uh, written by uh, a panel uh, through the DOJ. If you just Google uh, diversity in policing, you should find it. It talks about those three areas that, that I just mentioned. So in our personnel division, uh, the director there um, does an excellent job of recruiting for all different aspects of our community. Um, and work to, to hire the right people. 
Last place, Chief uh, Chief Manger uh, talked frequently about the fact that two of the most important, or three of the most important things that that were his responsibility as chief were to hire the right people, provide them with the proper training, and then hold them accountable. Uh, the first part of that address address. I don't have specific um, statistics on the officers in the sixth district to share with you. I can tell you that uh, we are a very diverse uh, department. I, I think we, if we don't meet uh, the same uh, numbers that the county does, I think we're close in many areas. We always have room for improvement. We're very aware of that and we're constantly working on it. So I'm gonna turn to Sheriff Popkin because I think that uh, the Sheriff's Office also um, as another uh, branch of law enforcement, uh, folks would certainly like to know about that. And uh, Commander Ward, what I'd like to do is ask if we could follow up and actually get that information and then we can post that on our website. But Sheriff Popkin, let me turn to you. The question specific to diversity for diversity for the Sheriff's Department. And then what are you doing specifically to help uh, make the uh, Sheriff's Department more diverse? Yeah, you know, um, Craig, it, it is certainly something that uh, we work very hard at. Um, the numbers are not where we would like it to be, to be perfectly mirror the community. But um, my numbers at the Sheriff's Office are actually very good. Um, I can provide those numbers to you specifically. Um, and that includes uh, a racial breakdown across all um, ethnicities and races, as well as female, male, I'm actually doing very, very well with that. Um, I don't want to misquote specifically, but I will provide all this to you. And um, we, we are certainly, that is something that is a standard that we, that I, that is way before any of the social justice stuff really occurred uh, recently um, that we've been trying to maintain for years and years and years. But I'll provide that for you. There's no problem with whatsoever. Excellent. And let me just say this, that I know that with our police department specifically and its partnership with Montgomery College, uh, when it comes to how to continue to grow the diversity of the workforce uh, within the police department is something that was a priority of Chief Major. I know that uh, Chief Jones is actively uh, continuing and supporting that program. Uh, I know that we've seen not only uh, us grow the diversity in terms of people of color, uh, but also when it comes to women. Uh, and we've seen great success through that program. And so hopefully uh, we can continue uh, to promote uh, those kinds of opportunities. And when we're of course marketing in the community, I think the community engagement piece uh, will be a big part of that as well. And that actually dovetails into uh, one of the other questions that came on here. And I'll throw this up for, uh, uh, for, for both our police and uh, sheriff. Uh, with the perception of police, uh, and specifically with people of color. Uh, what are you doing to ensure uh, that when it comes to dealing with a community that is primarily a community of color, you can establish a better working relationship, understanding that what they're seeing on TV and sometimes what they're experiencing in their communities is not always a positive one. This speaks directly to um, our community engagement effort. It's entirely what they are geared for to um, develop these trusting relationships with the community they serve. I'm a third generation police officer. I'll share with you that my uh, grandfather and uncle were New York City detectives. My father was a police officer for 30 years in Hartford, Connecticut. My wife's a retired detective. This is the environment I was created and born into, and I understand what my profession means. Um, Having said that, I, I will share that that uh, law enforcement is probably the most misunderstood profession out there um, because of influences like TV and movies and um, a lack of engagement between regular citizens and police. There's large misunderstandings of, of what my profession is actually about. Um, I think there's a... Uh, a failure for us to communicate who we are, what we do, and most importantly, why we do it. I can tell you be behind every man and woman who enters this profession is a person that is deeply committed to risking their life to help other people. 
And you don't hear that too often. And, and I can't quite place my finger on why, but we're working every single day to educate our public on who we are, what we actually do, and most importantly, I think why we do it. We have activities like our Citizens Academy, which I would encourage anyone to check out and, and to partake in. Really quickly, I wanna share a quick story about um, something incredible that the Gaithersburg City Police Department have done under, under uh, Chief uh, Shroka. Over the summer, there was a number of protests uh, calling for police reform, and, and a number of them that occurred in the 6th District and in Gaithersburg City. Uh, when we could, we would reach out to the organizers and, and collaborate with them, but also try to work with them. Gaithersburg City reached out to the organizers a number of these events that occurred in Gaithersburg City, and they've been working with them now for a couple of months. They've been engaging with them. They've actually brought them to the Montgomery County Police Training Academy and ran them through scenarios. So those are the types of things we like to do, and I know we're short on time. I, I would love to continue this conversation uh, at any time, to be honest with you. Well, thank you very much for that. I'm gonna try and combine three together. Uh, Montgomery Village stats uh, for crime versus other parts of the county. Um, how are they, as well as uh, because of the growth that we're seeing in Montgomery Village, do we have enough officers to actually manage uh, the continued growth, both commercial and residential? And what about the Montgomery Village team? Is that going to continue? We'll try to go through these quickly. Uh, most of our stats, like I mentioned, are, are included on our website. We also have uh, Data Montgomery that captures a lot of the stats that are available online. Also, you can shoot me an email and I'll, I'll uh, be happy to engage with anybody on a one-by-one -one basis. Do we have enough police officers? No. Uh, I don't. Uh, however, I will preface that by saying I don't think we could go anywhere in our country and find any law enforcement professional that would admit they have enough people. Uh, that's just a constant state that we are always in. I will share with you 27 years ago, the population of Montgomery County was 750,000. When I graduated the police academy, we had 1,050 police officers. Our population is significantly higher today and we have 1,300. We only have 250 more than we did 27 years ago. We are short on the street. I think that the public would be shocked if they knew uh, the numbers of officers on the street at any given time. In my opinion, it's nowhere near as many as we should have. Um, we make do with that. Uh, we are constantly looking to be more efficient and to uh, perform our profession uh, more streamlined manner, but we could always, always use more police officers, the right people trained properly and then held accountable. Uh, the last part of that question, Mr. Rice. Uh, the last part dealt with, um, oh my gosh, I'm sorry. Uh, what's um, uh, the oh, Montgomery Montgomery Village Village team. team? Yes. Yes. Well, I certainly hope we're going to keep them. They are a huge asset to the district and the community we serve. Uh, they are extremely dedicated professionals. Uh, the sergeant that leads them is an outstanding uh, sergeant. Uh, I would hope that we get to keep them because they're doing great work. Excellent. Um, I want to turn to fire because there was a great question asked about um, whether or not uh, our fire department is trained to look for signs of abuse, whether it's child abuse, elder abuse, all kinds of things, w whether they're trained to identify those when they're responding to a call. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Rice, for the question and for the uh, member watching the forum for that question. Yes, as part of our reoccurring protocol and update continuing education process, we do have sessions for elder abuse indicators and, and Mr. McCarthy and the sheriff outlines and, and Diane how we are a part of the the elder abuse task force and working together and in, in helping those that we see that may be in such circumstances. Additionally, through the child abuse, same point as our members do their research and their protocol updates, information and training is provided on those key signs, indications, traits, and ways to refer to child protective services or adult protective services. Thank you very much for that, Chief. That was great. Um, so let me ask one more question very quickly uh, that, that uh, uh, Commander, you should be able to answer. Uh, mini motorcycles, um, what's the deal with those? Are they legal? Are they allowed to run on sidewalks? What are we doing about enforcement when it comes to those? 
complex question. Um, my my background is obviously, as I, as I mentioned earlier, investigative, but uh, I'm going to take a little bit of a crack at this and then refer anybody to uh, me back again, and I'll confer with our experts on this. Right now, it seems like it depends on the CCs of the size, which indicates the size of the engine. Also depends on whether uh, the vehicle is uh, titled through the MVA or registered uh, through the MVA. Uh, if they're registered and they have a, a registration plate, they're legal. Uh, but not for paths and grassy areas, only used on public roadways. Non-electric motorcycles are illegal off-road on county property or property open to the public. Uh, private property only with uh, written permission um, on roads only if registered. A uh, lot of intricacies there. Uh, our traffic division are the experts on this. The motor officers that work for me, the experts on this. Anybody with a more specific question or uh, whose question I didn't answer, reference that, please contact me and I will uh, get, either get the answer or refer, refer you to the experts. So I'm gonna go to uh, two last questions because um, we're, at, at, we're at 8.32. Um, the first one, I'm actually gonna go off script a little bit and send this one uh, to both Sheriff Popkin and to uh, State's Attorney McCarthy. Um, you've you talked about the uptick in domestic violence. Um, for, for people who are experiencing domestic violence, understanding that COVID has uh, put uh, folks in uh, direct contact with their abuser uh, for a much more prolonged period of time, which unfortunately in some cases results in uh, uh, death of that individual. What can people do if they need help? Sheriff, I'll turn to you and then uh, State's Attorney McCarthy. Uh, Councilmember Rice, uh, first of all, if anybody is in, in fear for whatever reason, and it is that sort of situation where they are in, in fear for their life, they need to call 911 immediately. If it's, if it's a situation where it's ongoing family violence, ongoing family abuse, the courts are open 24 hours a day with the commissioner uh, to receive any sort of protective order, restraining order. The Family Justice Center is open uh, uh, um, Monday through Friday during day, daytime hours, and then the crisis center is open during the other hours. Uh, John McCarthy has full-time staff that are there at the Family Justice Center that can answer any sort of legal questions associated with if there's any sort of crime. I've got uh, victim assistance, victim cl uh, client assistance that are there. Uh, we have therapists on, 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 on staff. We have everything that potentially someone may need to get themselves some help because living in, living in that sort of violence and living in fear is just something that will end up with someone getting hurt. Yeah, the, the, the sad part of it, Craig, is that uh, isolation and control are within the cycle of domestic violence are very common. And when you have the isolation that comes with a COVID kind of crisis and people don't have access, it's, 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 a, it's a perfect formula when you throw in the tension financial pressures and everything else that comes with this uh, with this uh, pandemic, uh, it, it's a, a perfect formula for domestic violence. And, and even when our numbers were down in terms of crimes, the one exception was in the area of domestic violence, which continued to outpace even last year's number, even when everything else was 50% of last year's number. Well, thank you very much. And just, um... Again, for anyone who is experiencing domestic violence, please, please reach out to one of our uh, great institutions, whether it's the Family Justice Center or the Crisis Center. And of course, if you fear for your life, please do call 911. Um, just, just a very quick, since this is our last one, uh, on both Facebook Live as well as on here, uh, La Villa had a shooting uh, October 19th. Have we uh, solved that case yet? Uh, Commander, any suspects, anything along there in terms of progress for that case? We're working closely with Gaithersburg City Police uh, on that case. And um, it's nothing that I can actually share tonight. We'll keep everybody updated if the investigation continues. Well, thank you very much. Well, look, gentlemen, I really just want to say thank you. I want to thank my community uh, for being so engaged and asking excellent questions, uh, really uh, pushing us uh, on so many um, uh, avenues to be able to think about how we continue to make sure that our police department is more 
uh, even more responsive to the needs and concerns of the community uh, to make sure that we're aware of all the great things that are happening when it comes to fire prevention, uh, to be aware of the programs that are out there to protect the most vulnerable in our community, uh, and that we have a prosecutor that will be there to ensure uh, that those who try to prey on our community are, are prosecuted and kept from continuing uh, to bring scourge uh, and, and challenges to our community for those hardworking individuals who just want to continue to live their lives each and every day. Uh, I really want to thank Montgomery Village uh, for, uh, again, stepping up and, and attending this great meeting. I want to thank my colleagues, both Council President Katz, uh, uh, Council Member uh, uh, Albernos, and uh, Council Member Juwando. I want to thank Delegate Alcivero for coming out. I really want to thank uh, uh, Miss, uh, 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 Dr. Daca. Um, and also just a reminder again that all of our uh, services are available via text. You can text 911 as well, so you don't actually have to call. Uh, you know, text 911 is actually a service that um, we decided to ramp up to make sure that it's even safer uh, for those individuals who are fearing uh, in, in a situation. Look, this isn't the first and this won't be the last of these types of meetings uh, where I want to make sure that you understand uh, who the people are uh, who are there to protect and serve you and how you can reach them and contact them about concerns that you have in your community. You don't need me uh, to be the one as the intermediary for you to establish and make sure that the relationship between you and the departments are even better and stronger. I certainly want to serve in that role as a convener, uh, but you have the power as an individual in our community to make sure that your uh, concerns are met. Uh, that's what this whole process is about. And that's why you heard everyone give their contact information. We will make sure that that's available on our website. We'll be pushing it out via social media as well. I encourage all of you to continue to be vigilant in your communities about what you see, what you wanna have happen, uh, and make sure that your voice is heard. Uh, and I also encourage you during this COVID time to make sure that you wear your mask, you practice proper uh, physical distancing and that you remain safe. Uh, thank you again to all of my panelists uh, for all of their time this evening. Thank you to my staff, uh, to both my chief of staff, Sharon Ledner, uh, all of my folks in the office, uh, Kristen Tribble, uh, Daniela Moya Gaber, uh, Rose Taylor, who lives in the village. Uh, just really wanna say thank you to all of you for making this such a fantastic, fantastic event. So thank you very much. Take care, God bless, and stay safe. You hear me say, yes, we've reached our peak in Montgomery County, or the governor or deputy secretary or secretary say, we've reached the peak in Maryland. That does not mean we go back to business as we knew it before COVID-19 the next day. We'll continue and need to continue to keep those strategies